Everybody had a pretty busy um, last two years, uh, been up to a lot of things. We certainly have been, and I am very excited to talk about what we have been up to. My name is Luke Sleeman, I'm Principal Developer at Itty Bitty Apps, and I've been contracted out to be working with ANZ. Uh, we've also got Kira here tonight, she's a uh, mobile chapter lead at ANZ, uh, here to help me with some of the demos and help me with this presentation. Before I get into this, I've got to give a huge amount of thanks to another well-known person in our community, Rob Amos. These are his slides that I am presenting to you this evening, and this is, is his talk. He has given this presentation previously at Coca Heads. Uh, Rob is an independent contractor. His job title changes a lot, but for the last two years, he also has been part of the Itty Bitty Apps and ANZ team working on building the brand new app. So if you want to see Rod's presentation and see the iOS version of this, it's all there in the Melbourne Coca Heads YouTube channel. So you may have heard that we built a new app and you can see it here up on the screen. It's also been in the news. Um, it's been very um, exciting working on an app where there are editorials and newspaper articles being written about it. But I think saying that we just built a new app is really selling it short. What we have actually created here is a whole new retail banking platform. So what you see when I start talking about this new app and our code base is really just the tip of the iceberg, the bit that's poking above the water. I think, and so what you're beginning to see is just what this new platform is about. I think the other key thing that we have built that I am super proud of is the team of developers we have got together and the process and culture we have created. The ANZ um, Plus mobile development team is now more than 70 mobile developers. That's more than 70 iOS and Android developers. Please somebody correct me if I'm wrong here, but we believe it's probably the biggest mobile development team in the Southern Hemisphere. We also have an amazing continuous integration and deployment process. We release to the Play Store twice a week and the average time between a pull request being merged and it being out on phones in customers' hands is three days. So there's a lot of exciting stuff and I'm really hoping in the future we'll be able to give talks about many of these exciting subjects and many of the tech things that we're doing. We've got some really interesting tech choices. For example, no fragments. We instead used Conductor as a library to do it. We built our own dependency injection system in 200 lines of code. We're transitioning the entire code base um, over to Compose. We've used the FIDO standard and the WebAuth N standard to almost entirely remove passwords and pin from the app. But all of that is for another day because today I'm gonna focus on introducing the app and talking about some of the Android applications architecture. So for now, um, I'm gonna jump out and start the presentation and show you folks a bit of the demo of the application. And the first thing I want to do is this, jump into my recent applications and kill it and make sure there's absolutely nothing there so we can see what happens if you launch it cold. And here it is, immediately with no pin login, no spinners, we are in the app looking at all of our transactions and a lot of what you will see here is pretty similar for many banking applications. But one thing that I really love about it is if you go in and have a look at some money that you've spent, you don't just get like so much money from XYZ, ABC, proprietary, limited, so on and so on. We're enriching the transaction information with information we get from a company called Look Who's Charging. So you can see the company's logo, you can see where exactly it was, and you can even tap the number to phone the company where this money was spent. A key part of this application is we don't just want to do the standard banking thing and show everybody their transaction list. We want to focus heavily on financial well-being and improving our users' financial well-being. So we have this entire savings section of the application that prompts users to set up saving goals and allows them to like create and manage those goals and transfer money between them in a really elegant way. So for example, I have a few financial goals, like being able to afford buying a lettuce, which is currently, oh, yeah. 
Everyone in the audience is like, oh, I hear ya, I hear ya. For those watching the YouTube recording, it's currently selling at over $10 per lettuce. And as you can see, I've almost achieved my goal, but I can just go in and transfer some money from my everyday funds into the buy a lettuce goal and do the transfer. And what happens is that transfer will go through. We see that's happened and the goal's updated. You can see that there on that screen, but also all of this information about my available balance, my funds, my spending has updated as well. I'm, we've got two people here and we've got two screens. What I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna put a payment through to Kira so we can see what that process is like when we put a payment through. Ah, this is not my real PIN number. I will definitely be changing it after this presentation. And what you can see here is that the payment's gone through to Kira oh. and no, it's not working because we need to restart the um, screen copy. Sorry about this, folks. The joys of live demos. Let's kick that one back off again. You'll have to give me some more money now. I will have to give <laughs> Kira some more money. <laughs> you can see that payments come through. I mean, that was that one there. Um, but I've got a better idea than giving Kira some more money. How about you send it back? <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So we'll pay Luke $10. And I think the thing to keep an eye on here is actually my phone and what happens on my screen as this payment comes through. And we should see that appearing in near real time. Not only is the transaction appearing there in the transaction list, we've also seen the balance updating, the spending, the money in and out. They all update together in real time. Now there's another trick that this app has up its sleeve that I want to show you and to do that, we have to go into aeroplane mode and put it offline. I'm also just gonna kill it again, just so we can see that there's no sort of memory cache there in data or anything like that. And here we are launching the app and we're back in again. And you can see all of the things, all of the information that I had there just before is still there. I can still go in and view my goals and see all of this information there in the application. I said before that we're really interested in enhancing people's financial well-being. And you can see here in the app, we're taking a lot of different ways to try and surface information that can help folks out with that. So for example, one important thing is to save uh, more than you spend. And you can see we have this tile that shows the money coming in and out over the last 30 days. We can look at that across larger date ranges and sort of page backwards and forwards in time and see how that's changed. We can also get a lot of insights in how we're spending money. And I particularly love this screen in that it's driven by the accelerometer. <laughs> so as I bubble this thing around, you can see the bubbles all bouncing around. And we can drill down into these different categories and have a look at like, where is all my money going? Well, there's a lot being spent on my lifestyle there and a lot on eating out and drinking out. And I can then jump in and view all of those transactions and where all of that money's going. If there's a particular transaction I'm interested in finding or having a look at, there's a search. So for example, I remember I went to a really nice brewery, but I don't remember when it was and where it was. So I can just search for that, tap on it and view it. And again, we can see that on the map, get directions to it and phone it all. But you see, I'm actually offline there in aeroplane mode. And all of that data is still there and present on the phone and we're presenting that great user experience. Let's jump back into the presentation and see how that works. So before I get into any specifics, I'd like to give you a bit of context of the overall architecture of how the app's designed. Or oh, this presentation is gonna sound pretty weird. The ANZ Plus app contains an offline copy of all of the user's relevant banking information. And that content is rendered to the user directly from this cache. So all of the things you saw in that demo was not coming back from web services. It was coming from the data stored in the cache on my device. A number of companies tried this around 2016, 2017, and many of these found it too difficult or couldn't get the user experience right and ended up abandoning the idea. So the crux of this talk then is how we've banished the refresh button and almost all of the loading spinners from this app and the steps we've taken to ensure that the user feels confident that the data they're looking at is current and up to date. 
And there's also one final call out I want to do before I really jump into it. There's no back end for front end. There's no BFF here in our design. We don't have a specific back end that was created just for the mobile app. So I'm going to start by talking about some common architectural pitfalls that teams face. And as I mentioned, a bunch of companies tried this approach and failed. This section, we're going to talk about some of the things that we think went wrong with them and how we have architected the ANZ app plus app to avoid this sort of fate. And the first pitfall that I want to talk about is incremental synchronization. When you have a local database like this, many people's initial instinct is to go, cool, we can easily just do incremental sync and update the columns and rows that have changed on the back end. But a couple of issues come up. How can we do forwards and backwards compatibility? If the user has an old version of the app on the phone and we've got the old database schema and then they upgrade to the new schema and a bunch of new columns appear and a bunch of new tables appear, how do we go about getting that data down onto their device? Likewise, if you're performing an incremental sync of a data set, what do you do if the sync is interrupted or it um, has network issues or the user's app crashes? How do you ensure the consistency of your local data and repay those missed transactions? Well, the simple answer is we avoid a lot of that. We work around this by breaking our local cache data into sets and then resynchronizing the entire set whenever it changes. The calls to do this are always item potent, meaning the result is always the same no matter how many times the operation is performed. And at the end of that synchronization, the data set is guaranteed to mirror exactly what's on the back end systems. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about how we do this later in the presentation. Another common pitfall with keeping a bunch of local data that you need to reconcile with remote changes, and one that I think we're all intimately familiar with as developers, is merge conflicts. We should all be very familiar with this about how easily they can occur and the many different strategies you have when you've got local data and you've got remote data and you need to try and reconcile the changes in both of them. And again, we just avoid them entirely. We make one user experience trade-off here, which is we don't allow writes unless the app is online. And generally speaking, for our particular problem domain of banking, that's not much of a trade-off because many of the user interface interactions go and change the world out there. They're transferring money over to people and you can't do this if you're offline. With that restriction in place, we've adopted what we call unidirectional data flows. In the data flows in a single direction via the back end, into the local cache and then up into the app's UI. And I've got a whole set of slides that describe how this works later on. Another pitfall that people fall into is trying to cache API responses. There's a whole group of people who advocate for caching API responses directly. And it is a very valid option depending on your use case and depending on your domain. But there are trade-offs and restrictions there. In particular, by caching API responses directly, you put a lot of limitations on what you can do from a user experience perspective. So instead, we have a local cache, which is that database, which is optimized for the user experience. For an example, that search that you saw would be almost impossible to do offline if we were caching hitting a transaction's endpoint. The things with the spending categories and the money in and out, again, would all require separate endpoints that you have to case individually. Another reason for not caching API responses is around permissions. Um, how can we easily accommodate different account types, joint accounts, if the same API endpoint returns different results depending on the user's logged in credentials? And it then becomes very difficult to mix together these different cached responses to build a nice fluid UI. Now, this is a hard thing to do. This is not easy. It is very easy to just cache all the API responses. But one of the key things we've done at ANZ Plus is user experience trumps all. And we've lent very hard into very heavily in some, into some of these hard trade-offs and decided to do the hard thing to provide a better user experience. The Android app itself is split into two modules. We've got a services module which caches all the data and is responsible for communicating with the backend web services, and an app module where all of our screens live 
and the user-facing logic is contained. Let's zoom in on the services a little bit and have a look at what's inside there. Within this portion of the app, the lower portion, we store data using Room and on top of a database called SQL Cipher. SQL Cipher is a specific version of SQL Lite that you can just plug into Room and it stores all the data in an encrypted file rather than inside a plain text file. And it gives us a couple, an ability to do a couple of really powerful things by using Room and an underlying SQL database. Firstly, we can do SQL. We can query the database directly, which allows us to provide a lot of those experiences like you saw the categories, the search. A second very important thing is you, with Room, can expose flows of your data. So you can see there, we've got a method of getting transactions. And we don't just query for a list of transaction, we actually get a flow of a list of transaction. We observe changes in the data set, and every time it changes, a new one gets emitted upwards. We make very heavy use within this app of flows and coroutines. The views in our app module, those screens you saw there, aren't just like querying the database and getting a result back. Instead, they're all subscribing to flows of updates. Once we receive new data in the bottom at the service layer, it gets inserted into the database. And then all of that flows outwards to the subscribe view models. And this is how we do things like that spending in and out, the balance, all the money tiles, all updating together at the same time. Now, you saw before I was mentioning this thing called unidirectional data flow and how it was one of the key components of how we can put this system together. How we avoid merge conflicts. We say this is unidirectional because that cache sitting on the device is never updated directly by the user interface. Those screens don't write stuff into the database. More specifically, we only cache full records that have been returned from the back end. We don't cache partial records or partial updates. So for example, if I was to change the name of one of those goals, we wouldn't just like save the updated goal name into the database and send that back to the back end. Instead, we send the entire updated goal to the back end, which updates its systems, pushes it back to the mobile device that comes in at the lower end of that services module, and then that update flows out to all of the interested screens. So when we put it all together, you get this. And this is a tech demo from early in our development, and honestly, it still blows me away years later. We see two devices both logged into the same account. And what they're doing is they're, they're on the same screen in the same account, and they're changing the goal on one screen, and then we see it almost instantaneously appear on the second device. Just to be clear what you're seeing here, this is not some peer-to-peer -peer thing going on through the emulators or ADB. This is doing a complete round trip back to the servers and the second device is listening into that stream of updates. So this is all really cool to see. But what really blew me away was when I saw the pull request that turned this on. Because I saw the video and I thought, oh boy, this is going to be a huge PR. How do we make this thing work? And I looked at it and it was tiny. It was just a couple of lines changed that enable particular things and plug specific things together. What you see occurring here is not a complicated thing we need to build on a screen-by-screen -screen basis. It is fundamentally implied by our architecture, that unidirectional data flow, writing the data back to the service and the updates flowing towards the UI allow this to happen. So, I can see a lot of faces in the audience and it feels like um, a lot of you are feeling um, what we're building here is not very typical of a lot of mobile apps. In fact, this is about as far away as you can get of a typical sort of JSON pretty printer app as you can go. And what do I mean by a JSON pretty printer? We've all worked on these apps. You're in a screen, you press a button, it calls a REST web service, a JSON response comes back, it gets displayed on the next screen. You press the next button, there's another loading spinner, another JSON response comes back, and it comes back on the device. We deliberately didn't want to do this at the start of the project. We wanted to lean as hard as we could into taking advantage of the power we get by running on these incredibly powerful mobile devices and having all the data there. I'm saying what we're doing is a bit out there for mobile apps, but it's not unique. There are in fact a heap of parallels between what we're doing in distributed and cloud computing ecosystem. As an example, you could call what's on this device in our local case, cache, 
a read replica of a remote database. And in some senses, you're not very far from the truth there. One of the distributed computing patterns we use is eventual consistency, which is normally used to describe high availability systems. And this is a high availability system. You all saw me take it offline there. Eventual consistency says that if we execute a write operation on a node in the system, um, and the system functions long enough, eventually all of the nodes will include that write operation will know the state of the data. So rather than considering our code base, rather than considering this app a client of an API or remote server, we fundamentally consider ourselves a node in a distributed computing network. Once we settled into that paradigm, a lot of things fell into place very easily. And that's why, for example, with that demo on the previous screen with all of the stuff going on two devices, it was a tiny PR that enabled that. You also would have seen from the demos that we're getting very good performance on this. So even though we say eventual consistency, what's actually happening is it's typically 50 to 200 milliseconds. But we know we don't operate in ideal network conditions. In fact, just before I saw these demos, I noticed I had one bar of reception and thought, oh my gosh, how's this demo going to go? And that's the point of eventual consistency. If for some reason your network access is appallingly bad, we can apply backup strategies to ensure that we do in fact become eventually consistent. One final pattern that underpins everything we do, I mentioned it before, idempotency. All the APIs we interact with strive to be idempotent. That means no matter how many times we call them, the result will be the same. That means it's safe to retry those API calls as many times as necessary. To illustrate it, here's a totally made up example in Kotlin. We've got a Boolean and we've got two functions. The set on function is idempotent. No matter how many times I call it, no matter how many times I retry it, the end result is always going to be the same. Toggle is not. If you keep calling that method, everything's going to flip on and off repeatedly. You never know what the value will be at the end of it. Let's talk about synchronization now. How do we get this data into the local cache? How do we keep it up to date? I said previously, we don't do incremental syncs, but you're probably thinking, well, hang on a minute. What happens if I have um, the user's entire bank details? Pulling all of that down in one hit would be very prohibitive. And in fact, it is. So what we actually do is we break the data into multiple independent data sets. And each of those data sets is fully synchronized, is synchronized fully each time we do it. There is one exception to this, and that is the transaction list. After you've been using it, well, you've got a million transactions. We can't just download them every single time the transaction list changes. So we do support incremental syncing of those transaction details. But the amount of effort that goes into supporting this single incremental sync is more than all of the other data sets combined. So otherwise, the data sets are fully independent from each other and storage agnostic. That is, they could be stored in that SQLite database, but some bits we just store inside memory. We make no assumptions on where the data sets live. This leads into some design trade-offs. Even though we use a relational database, there are no foreign keys across data sets. You can have it within a data set, but they don't bridge across the data sets. Because each sync occurs independently, we can't make assumptions about the order in which things are synced. I made a terrible mistake early on in building this app. I said to the Android team, surely we can assume that there's at least an account present. What is the user doing in the app if they don't have an account? Now, that was a bad assumption because we know that the accounts will be synced at some stage, eventually, we don't know when. And if we build our screens to rely on having those account details um, there, it's all going to fall down when they're unavailable. And we're going to have foreign keys that can't resolve. This does mean that we push the burden onto the UI to handle that. There's things, I have to code screens that deal with no account being present. But when you design this from the beginning to handle these missing cross references and do things as gracefully as you can, and you never make assumptions about this, it's a lot easier to do it from the get-go. I'm glad I got called out on that mistaken assumption years ago rather than weeks ago. And it's a lot easier to build this stuff from the beginning than trying to retrofit it. We wrap everything, all of this synchronization stuff up in a pattern called commands. Most commands exist to perform a full sync of a specific data set. 
and they can appear in the app from anywhere, either pushed in remotely from the server or generated locally when we strongly suspect something has changed. All commands are item potent. The work a command might do could be different on each launch, obviously, because the remote node we're synchronizing with could contain different data on it. But the result of the command is always the same. That is, when it completes, that local data cache will be identical to the remote node. From a code perspective, though, commands are just a very simple block of code. You've essentially got a name and a property and a function to perform that synchronization. And that perform function should just essentially return a success or a failure. We wrap all of this up into a platform called Command Center. And you can think of this very much like a worker queue. Commands enter the queue from anywhere. They could get pushed in from the server, telling is commanding is to resynchronize some data or generate it locally. And they're processed by a worker queue as appropriate. Let's break it down. We need some guarantees to make this system work, things that you can rely on. And our first guarantee we provide to the remote system is about how we will process these commands that they send us. We guarantee that for the remote commands, they will be successfully delivered onto the device. To do this and to ensure timely delivery, each ANZ Plus app keeps a persistent gRPC stream open to the remote command center. And as soon as they receive commands, it's forwarded down that persistent stream, the stream of commands directly to us. We then throw it in a local queue and the queue persists those commands to disk. So if for some reason we do crash, or um, the user decides to kill the app, the next time we open it up, those commands are still there, they don't get lost. And our item potent APIs guarantee that we can perform these commands anytime without concern. It's only once we've confirmed that that command has been successfully received and persisted to the queue to disk that we tell the remote stream to sort of update its stream marker. And we use the marker to know to resume the stream and pick it up when we reconnect. In this manner, we've got a guaranteed delivery. Either a remote command is enqueued and persisted locally, or the next time we connect to the stream, it's gonna, um, we reuse that old marker and that command will get pushed to us. The other guarantee, the second one, and we need to make it all work, is we guarantee that each command will be executed at least once. We have worker tasks to process the enqueued commands using coroutines um, in parallel. Any commands that fail are moved into a dead letter queue. And a dead letter queue is another enterprise pattern from these distributed systems. It's basically a parking lot for anything that fails. Uh, common reasons the command might fail are things like network issues, being offline, or perhaps the remote servers down those particular service outages in particular areas. The guaranteed execution part comes through the second last item in this list here. Persisted items are not removed from the disk until they succeed. So we're guaranteed to execute a command at least once until it succeeds. Now, I know we've got a lot of mobile developers in the, the room, but some of you may be familiar with things like Amazon SQS. And if you are, a lot of this may seem quite familiar to you. It's based in part around how SQS works, although to be fair, message queuing patterns have existed a long time before Amazon Web Services came along. So all of this stuff is really cool when the app is open. And that persistent stream we've got keeps all of our data up to date within hundreds of a millisecond. What if the app isn't open? Do we wait until the next time the user opens the app and then pull that new data down? Of course not. We designed from the beginning to try and update the data before the user knows they're going to need it. We support synchronizing in the back end based off client, silent client push notifications and work manager. And the user experience we're aiming for here is that the banking app in your pocket is always up to date and it knows everything that's happened before you do. So when you open the app the next time, that balance is already current. It's all there in front of you. It should be just like magic. But again, we avoid incremental synchronization here. When we're woken up in the background via those push notifications, regardless of what's going on, we connect to the remote command center stream, we process all of the incoming commands, and we go back to sleep, just as we would if the app was open. And this means the code for all this is the same, the patterns for all of this is the same. It makes it extremely easy to debug and diagnose these issues. Before I wrap up, 
The last thing I wanted to talk about is data security. Given that we're going to all of this effort to ensure that your banking information is stored on the device in your pocket that you're carrying around with, it's very important to know that that data is secure. And the first thing to say is that there's some data we just aren't going to cache at all. For example, your phone numbers and addresses. It's personally identifying information. We, we don't keep that there on the device. The data that we do decide to cache needs to be justified and have a business reason to it. We need the transaction to provide that amazing experience. I'm going into the app to see my transactions, I'm not going into the app to see my home address and phone number. We can fetch that stuff when we need it. Everything we store offline is encrypted in that SQL Cypher database and the DB is encrypted with a key that's unique to your device and lives on the keychain with flags set to prevent it being backed up to other devices. A lot of developers here in the room and we all know that dealing with code that does encryption is notoriously complex and easy to get wrong and break. So we have a number of fail safes in place including a bunch of unit tests that run as part of our standard CI process on every PR that ensure that that database is always going to be encrypted. We also have further fail safes that run directly on the device that checks the database at a very raw level for the, um, see if there's any plain text data we can read out of it. And if it is, we know the encryption's failed and we delete it from the device. In some circumstances, if we feel the risk on a particular device is high, we'll disable some features in the app, like background syncing, and wrap the encryption key in one that's derived from your app pin. This is to protect against the unlikely scenario of malware trying to harvest ANZ plus cache data, or the more likely scenario of the users disabling a lot of their OS protections, such as your face ID, your fingerprint things, not putting pin codes on their phone. So that's it. We have reached the end of the presentation. I'm really happy to take questions from the audience, both if people want to put their hand up, if we can take questions, or afterwards in person. While we're doing that, I'm just going to keep this slide up. We've seen a lot of the cool tech stuff. You can also sign up for the app and play around with the user side of it and get a lot more info there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luke. Nice to have another one.